Government's decision to increase the number of judges appears to be paying off. The rationale given for the calling off of Soka 5.0 show. The QEH announces changes with antenatal care. And in sports, Johnny Graves leaves the CWI at the end of October. Broadcasting from our studios in the Pine St. Michael, this is CBC Newsnight, starting now. Good evening, I'm Pearson Bowen. Barbados is a step closer to having new rules to move cases through the judicial system more quickly. According to Attorney General Dale Marshall, the proposed changes to the criminal procedures should be in place by the end of next month. He says they have been sent to stakeholders to be reviewed. He made that announcement on the sidelines of a CARICOM Impacts Crime Gun Intelligence Unit meeting. The criminal procedure rules have been with the bar since May. Um, it is going to be vital for all of the participants, all of the stakeholders to, to know what the proposed rules will be. Uh, they've also been with the commissioner, they've also been with the, the office of the DPP. So all the stakeholders have had them since May and invited to, to return with comments uh, by mid-August. Uh, we are now going to be having a symposium again with all of the stakeholders so we actually go through the rules with everybody. If there are issues, we flag them then. If there are things that we can do better, we take into account the experience of the judges, the experience of the lawyers. Mr. Marshall adds, due to government's decision to increase the number of judges on the bench, the criminal justice system has disposed of 584 cases over the last 18 months. He says while 67 of them were for murder, dealing with such a significant number of cases must be seen as a phenomenal accomplishment. The new initiatives that we've put in place, the plea bargaining legislation, which will allow people to, to enter an early plea, um, or, or negotiate a, 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 a plea and sentence with the DPP is also going to help us to move, move things through quickly. Uh, the judge alone trial, we have to see if there's going to be any take up on that. We haven't seen any yet, but it's still early days. But the ability to, to, to do a trial in the absence of a jury, that will also cut down on time. So there are a whole variety of things that we are putting in place. To Addressing that opening ceremony of the CARICOM impacts meeting, the Attorney General reported that as of September 2023, there were 292 firearm cases waiting to be tried. He says the Barbados Police Service statistics show between January and June 2023, there were 75 firearms-related offences and 63 over the same period this year. According to Mr. Marshall, 142 firearm trials passed through the Kola courts over the last 18 months. I bring these figures to you to show that the fight is multifaceted. The courts are involved in this. The police service are involved in this. But obviously the missing element that we don't talk about too much, and I'm not going to dwell on it overly this morning, is the involvement of our communities. Um, I constantly say that the police service is only called in after things happen. Uh, nobody thinks to call them in and say, uh, we heard the fellas on the block talking about guns and giving us the kind of information that we want. The fight against firearms, firearms trafficking, has to be an all of society endeavor. A group of police officers and other officials are participating in that three-day sensitization and awareness meeting being hosted by CARICOM Impacts and the United States Department of State Partners. Deputy Chief of Mission, U.S. Embassy Bridgetown, Karen Sullivan, says the training will enhance stakeholders' collective efforts to combat the trafficking of firearms. This workshop brings together dedicated participants from law enforcement and customs agencies all committed to understanding and advancing the mission and key values of the CARICON Crime Gun Intelligence Unit, the CGIU. Our goal is clear, to leverage information and intelligence sharing to disrupt the means and methods employed by firearms traffickers. 
The Barbados Police Service says its new marketing strategy using social media is working well. Commissioner of Police Richard Boyce tells CBC News the public has been reacting positively to videos of people who have been charged or, or wanted. We know what public general public would feed on and we, we have an appetite for that type of commercialism and putting exciting things out there and looking at what is coming out from what is being put up by the police in terms of advertising or capturing public attention. It is working tremendously for us. Because when we look at the number of persons who are logging on to the site and giving us feedback, not only feedback, but feedback, all, not, but positive feedback in terms of solving some of these matters, assisting us with finding wanted persons and bringing them to justice, those are the type of outcomes that we are hoping for and that we are seeing. Commissioner Boyce credits the new campaign to those working in the service press and community relations department. Of crime involve the youth and persons just over the age limit, probably not only teenagers, but those in the 20s and 30s. And there's that, that group of persons, that cohort of persons that we need to capture their imagination and also persons who are over, far over that age. So once we put those types of messages out there and start to catch you with, stimulating with, engaging with things that can capture persons' imagination. Water levels rose significantly in some areas of the island today as Met officials issued a flood watch warning for Bridgetown and the western districts in Barbados. The higher waters made it difficult for some residents of Review Road Bush Hall to get into and out of their homes. Motorists also found traversing some roads challenging. The flash flood warning came as the Barbados Met Services closely monitors the progress of the potential tropical cyclone 5, which is approximately 280 miles northeast of Barbados. Met officials say the presence of that system resulted in light wind speeds across the island and moderate to intense showers across western and some central districts throughout the afternoon. Well, Minister of Home Affairs and Information Wilfred Abrams has declared the 2024 Crop Over Festival one of the best, despite several challenges. Mr. Abrams, who is the Member of Parliament for Christchurch East, was speaking during the constituency's annual general meeting. Minister Abrams sought to explain the rationale for calling off the Soka 5.0 show after it had started. He said there was a bad lightning storm off Barbados with about 300 strikes occurring in 15 minutes. The Prime Minister again went real simple. She said, if this storm passes over and lightning hits down in the botanical gardens, can there be injury or loss of life? And all the meteorologist says yes. With that amount of lightning, if it passes over Barbados and a strike happens in that vicinity, yes, you may get significant injury to persons and loss of life. At that point, the Prime Minister said, and we're here, nothing more. Pull it. The concert has started. But the concern was more for the lives of Barbados. Mr. Abrams admits after the decision was taken, the storm veered away from the island. However, he notes the high winds resulted in some challenges for band leaders who were preparing for Grand Kadumen the following day. This led to two hours delay of the start time. A lot of the bands, their preparation for going on the road got hampered. Their things got damaged. Stuff got stripped off of the, the trailers. They had to put themselves back in a position to be able to jump. The decision to delay cropper was not a, a willy-nilly decision. The decision to delay cropper was because, because a number of the band leaders wanted and asked for extra time because they could not get their bands on the road to meet the scheduled time. I will tell you that some were even talking about postponing the festival. You know that, right? A number of people were talking and saying that the, 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 the kadumut should actually be postponed. Chantel was having none of that. Neither was Carol Roberts.
Meanwhile, the minister in the Prime Minister's office with responsibility for culture has responded to calls for her resignation. Senator Dr. Chantal Monroe Knight has acknowledged some people believe she and the chief executive officer of the National Cultural Foundation, Carol Roberts, should be sacked for the handling of the 50th anniversary of Crop Over. However, Senator Monroe Knight has suggested that critics are viewing the festival through a single lens, looking only at a few events. The calling for my head, the calling for the CEO head, is the worst crop over. Yet we had the best and biggest soccer 5.0 that everybody has said was the best show of the season. We see crop over and we see four signal events. We see Kadumat, we see the pick of the crop, finals, see the same soccer 5.0. And in our mind, unfortunately, that is crop over. That is the festival, single lens. And that, again, is a narrative that we have to be very careful of. The minister says what must also be considered are the developmental programs which the NCF has been investing in. It doesn't show the investment that we have made to train tutors in costume making so that they then go back into the primary schools so that all of the costumes that you saw for Junior Kadumat were made in schools by those children themselves and supported by the National Cultural Foundation. Why? Because we start within the school system because we are building vision. Minister in the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Investment, Senator Chad Blackman, is urging constituents in the St. James North constituency to take full advantage of all opportunities presented to help Barbados become a world-class hub. Referring to work done through Member of Parliament for the area, Edmund Hinkson's Clarkson Foundation, Mr. Blackman says such programs need to be replicated across the island. He made a comment during his address at the constituency's annual general meeting held over the weekend. And that training proved significantly useful, building capacity for families, helping them to understand how to manage their affairs, but manage their affairs in a way that it can help them to be empowered in a changing Barbados, giving them the capacity and the new tools to help them to navigate sometimes what can be difficult waters on the ground. And therefore, programs like that, in my view, ought to be seen as a model for what can be also done across Barbados. Mr. Blackman adds the St. James North constituency is the beacon for where Barbados needs to go as a developing nation. However, he notes there are some challenges to overcome in the aftermath of Hurricane Barrow and has committed to creating a coastal community resilience program to assist those on the coast to adapt to its new realities. Meanwhile, Mr. Hinkson says the government is doing its best to make Barbados resilient and called on citizens to play their part. A government can't be behind you, as Chad said, when you drop a piece of paper out of a minibus when you're sitting down, or a chefette box, or when you put old fridge and old washing machine out in a gully. And we know last year, wasn't it? Mount Stanfast, they had a whole set of garbage out there and rain pouring, you know, in a flood, flood prone area. That is the truth. But then government now supposed to supposed to come when your house damage as a result of that government supposed to repair it. Can't be fair. You have to do your part. Still to come, more help coming for fisher folk affected by Hurricane Beryl. The antenatal clinic is returning to its home base at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital from next week. Chief Operations Officer Dr. Christine Greenwich says effective next Monday, patients will continue to access the clinic's services by reporting to the hospital. She was speaking to CBC News following the Pulse radio show on QFM. It means that we now are back where the clinic was originally located. It moved temporarily as we were um, conducting some work 
on the expansion of the AED and to have the patient population back within the hospital, we have much more access. It's a lot more convenient in terms of its location to get to and from the clinic. But most importantly, our patients now will be uh, receiving their services on one, one level um, um, of, of the facility. As they come into the main entrance, they remain on the main floor. Meanwhile, senior nurse and midwife assigned to the antenatal clinic, Sharon King, says the clinic, which offers a range of services, operates on an appointment basis. The antenatal clinic is usually on mornings from 8 to 11 to 11.30, 8 to 11 or to 11.30, and then our gynae clinic, that starts from 11 or 11.30 until 2.30, last appointment. We are... Uh, schedule clinic. In other words, we go by appointments, right? Um, our postnatals also comes in the morning. The Rotary Clubs of Barbados and the Cave Shepherd Group have come together to help boat owners and those in the fishing industry restore their livelihoods post-hurricane barrel. They have donated $30,000 to the effort. Already, the Rotary Clubs have provided $40,000 to help 10 boat owners get their vessels back into the water. President of the Rotary Clubs of Barbados, representing all Rotary Clubs on island, Arlene Ross, says when Hurricane Barrow struck, they immediately sprang into action. We reached out to our membership to raise funds and we reached out to Corporate Barbados to raise funds. We donated, earlier we donated a check and we donated some material to help fix the boats and today we are here again to donate another set of uh, material to help repair boats to get the fisher folk back into the water again to seal their livelihood. Cave Shepherd Foundation Community Engagement Lead Dale Niles says they understand the importance of supporting the initiative. We have a Cave Shepherd Community Fund, which is a private giving fund, and although that, that fund has not been officially launched, we understood the urgency of this need. And we stepped outside of that launch because our launch is due um, for next year in January, and we thought it was important to partner with the Rotary to be able to um, donate this money towards purchasing the supplies uh, to help our fisher folk. And President of the Bridgetown Fisher Folk Association, Adrian Muscles Wiltshire, says while he did not lose a boat, seeing the decimation to the industry has been painful for him. And I notified this set of um, fish um, boat owners, they were overly joyed because they know that the longest journey starts with one step. And as far as this, these donations is concerned, is much more than one step because the individual now see a future. They now see a reason for continuing. Well, the spotlight was on young people today as Barbados joined other countries around the world to mark International Youth Day. Among activities was a culture day hosted by the Ministry of Youth at the Quilombo Emancipation Village, where Minister Charles Griffith spoke about initiatives for young people. Anesta Henry has the report. Government is continuing to shed light on the positive things happening with the island's young people and its ongoing efforts to create opportunities for them. Minister of Youth, Sports and Community Empowerment Charles Griffith says the reintroduction of the National Youth Awards is one way the youth of the nation are being celebrated. Mr. Griffith was speaking to CBC at the Emancipation Village, where his ministry held a cultural day for the children from summer camps. In addition to that, we have several initiatives within the Ministry of Youth, Sports and Community Empowerment to ensure that the majority of our young people who want to be on that positive path, that the, our, all the means are in place for that to happen. Despite heavy showers, scores of children from the ministry summer camps were treated to a cultural display. They also got the opportunity to showcase art and craft they designed at camp over the last three weeks. Literally hundreds of children are here today and despite the rain, they're in good spirits and it is always good to be in an environment where you have something constructive happening for our young people. 
and all of the youngsters that I spoke with so far today indicated that they're having a fantastic time. The craft that I would have seen when I toured the exhibition is outstanding, and I know it is not the extent of the work that was done at all of the, the camps this year so far. International Youth Day is an awareness day designated by the United Nations that takes place on August 12. The purpose of the day, first observed in 2000, is to draw attention to a given set of cultural and legal issues surrounding youth. Anesta Henry, CBC News. Well, also to mark International Youth Day, youth advocates with the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Barbados are on a mission to help the nation's young people change their lifestyle to ensure longevity. Timon Howard and Ndjibiri Risco tell CBC News they're using social media as one of the tools to get their messaging across. And they say another initiative, their Cool School Nutrition Tours, has been a resounding success. Ms. Risco says there's more work to be done, and it has become a personal mission for her to help people with fostering a healthier lifestyle. I think it's understanding the pros and cons and realizing that you have one life to live and you should be able to live it to the fullest. So the important thing is being able to understand that being sick is not cool. It's not cool at all. Like the pain, the frustration, everything that comes with the suffering that the sickness brings is not something that you really want for yourself. Mr. Howard acknowledges the impact of their work, which will take some time, and breaking the patterns formed over generations will be difficult. Because as much as we're saying, don't do this, we also got to explain to you, all right, so how it is that you're going to facilitate this healthy diet that we're trying to have you all follow and stuff. So there's, there's work to be done, as Andrew Burry would have said, not just with the children themselves and the choices that they're making, but in pushing a general cultural shift in terms of what's made readily available. Time now for Sports Night as we go over to Mark Seal. Mark, good evening. Very good evening, Pearson. Very good evening. We're going to start with cricket, where Johnny Graves' role as Chief Executive Officer of Cricket West Indies is set to end in October this year. Grave had taken up the position in February 2017, assuming the position vacated by Michael Muirhead. Now, earlier this year, Grave had also sounded a warning to the ICC that its revenue share model was completely broken. Now, the CWI release also further stated the board will be initiating a comprehensive recruitment process to select the next CEO. Details regarding that recruitment process will be announced shortly and will be published across various media platforms to keep stakeholders informed. On out to horse racing where jockey Ricky Walcott rode Papillion to victory and took the 85th Barbados Derby in the Garrison and Savannah over the weekend. It was the featured race 7 of the Barbados Derby race day which carried a purse of $68,000. Barbados finished down the leaderboard at the recently concluded Caribbean Amateur Junior Golf Championship, which was held at the Caymanas Golf and Country Club in Jamaica. The highest placing for Team Barbados was in the girls 15 and under, where Mariella Young was fourth with a gross score of 41. Now in the boys 11 to 13, Joshua Sambrano was sixth with a 45, while in the boys 18 and under, Christopher Jackman and Gordon Chow were also sixth, with Jackman ended with a gross of 11 and Chow a 12. Puerto Rico were the overall winners, topping five of the six categories. Now, the Caribbean Amateur Junior Golf Championships were rescheduled after the original dates were cancelled due to the passage of Hurricane Barrel. Person, take a break here. Have more sports coming up later, though. All right, Mark, thank you. We'll be right back after this break with our business report. In business tonight, a new vehicle with unique features has been launched in Barbados. The Tank 500 Industry was unveiled at Heyman's Market St. Peter over the weekend. Chief Executive Officer of Caribbean Automobile Retailers Brent Murphy spoke about the new product before an audience that included Chinese Ambassador to Barbados, His Excellency Mr. Yang Zhusheng. The luxury, uh, the off-road capability, um, just functions like uh, traffic assist with uh, seat massagers, 
and uh, air cool seats front and rear. So if you're in traffic, you put on that traffic assist. You kind of sit back, turn on your massage. It has six massage functions, so you can do from, I can't remember all the names now, but you can do different patterns of massage. And you don't, when you put on traffic assist, you don't have to move off or stop. The car moves off and stops for you. And so you kind of sit back, put on your cooling seats, turn on your Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, and kind of relax in traffic. The CEO has also been speaking about his company's performance in the automobile market. In six months, uh, we are at 6% market share. And, uh, you know, we are really looking forward to more growth in the second half of the year. So that also is very positive how the Barbadian public have really embraced a new brand and a new car company. Um, but it's testament to their level of service and, and, and dedication. So I really want to say a big thanks to the team, Marsha and team, and um, really welcome you all to try the tank, both the 300 and the 500, and we also have the H6 and the H6 GT outside so that you can um, have a test drive. Meanwhile, China's ambassador to Barbados says Barbados is his country's good friend in the Eastern Caribbean, and China will continue to provide support within its capacity. The two countries have carried out fruitful cooperation in areas such as economy and trade, culture, education, and health care, setting example of mutual respect equality, mutual benefit, and common development between countries of different sizes. Time now for tonight's trading report. In Jamaica, Victon Wind Farm Limited ordinary shares with 3,503,168 units was the volume leader, followed by Trans Jamaican Highway Limited and Kingston Wharves Limited. In Trinidad and Tobago, JMMB Group Limited was the volume leader, with 27,966 shares changing hands for a value of Trinidad and Tobago $29,364.30, followed by Massey Holdings Limited. And here in Barbados, Goddard Enterprises Limited was the sole security, trading 18,394 shares at Barbados $2.96 each. And that's tonight's business report. More sporting action now. Once again, here's Mark Seal. Thank you very much, Pearson. The action in the Barbados Road Tennis Open went to the north of the island recently, Diamond Corner in St. Peter. Despite some rain interruptions, the matches served up the usual competitiveness. CBC's Anne-Marie Burke looks at some of the matches. Curtis Jones here to serve her Clarence Haynes as his opponent, and this match provided some good exchanges, like this one. Jones going hard, but Haynes answers. But Jones go for the soft touch, and that proves efficient. Haynes did keep the pressure on and was making Jones work the court to keep the ball in play. And if this reaching shot would cause Jones to fall into the net to keep the game as close as possible. But Jones was not about to fall behind and delivered this lovely drive to Hayes' left. Here we go again in front of the longer rallies. Both men showing class in this matchup. Backhand and forehand returns on point. But watch Jones as he goes for the kill. Nicely done. Haynes had some plays up his sleeve as well. Again, a sweet back and forth between the two men. Haynes, I must admit, had a strong backhand return and Jones quick reflexes to keep things going. And then Haynes spots the opening and capitalizes. This is the kind of road tennis I like to see. But on the business end of things, it was Jones who held the upper hand. And if this shot put the first game to match point in his favor. And here's where he claimed it. Haynes knocks out of court. Jones got first dibs at 21-14. The second game started in the same vein as the first with both players keeping up the pace. Haynes facing the screen now, however, came out with a vengeance and left Jones scrambling on this play. But Jones is not about to let this game slip out of his hands. And despite Haynes making him work for it, those lethal shots were sure injection. And while there are many times the scores drew level, Jones ensured to remind Haynes he meant business. 
and pinning Haynes 11 points. The latter part of the game was all Jones's. Nice cross-court shot. Game and match point. Jones serves and Haynes returns into the net. Jones wins the second game at 21-11 and the match is his. Also went on the night was Moser Williams in the black who got the better of Lloyd Burke, smoothly executed there. Williams took the first game at 21-19 and took the second by the same margin to secure his first victory of the Royal Tennis Open. And teenager Jal Graves back in the screen was leading Anthony Prince Haynes 21-6 and then 10-8 in the second game before Haynes retired hurt for Graves to also be a winner on the night. Minding your business. On this edition of Minding Your Business, it has been a while since we checked in with Omar Ward and his business Coral by Hand. And it's no surprise that the creative award-winning businessman has been continuing to grow from strength to strength. Omar recently embarked on a major project that has seen him creating some amazing monuments in different communities across the island that reflect some of the outstanding men and women from those communities. He talked about how he got involved. That came about by a gentleman here, Greg. So he was part of the St. Peter Committee. And he just saw me study the highway, caravan, and he told me about it. And I was like, okay. Then he passed back again, he bring this drawing and he said, oh, listen, these are, the, these are the names I want to put in your books or whatever. So I told him, um, the best thing I could do, when I do, then when I get to the book part, I got to put a towel inside so that I can write on the people's names that are significant to St. Peter. And also, when it comes to the parish of St. Peter now, what I did, instead of leaving it plain, I decided to look at the it's actually St. Peter map on Google mm. and I draw I draw all the roads and the different locations and different areas so that when you're looking at it you see it making sense. Now the success of his work in St. Peter opened the door for another major project which Omar recently completed in the Bayland highlighting some of the outstanding people who came from the constituency of St. Michael South and now he is poised to begin work to further highlight the outstanding sons and daughters of yet another constituency, and this one has special significance. The next one going to be for Bushall, mm -hmm. right? That's the, um, the Prime Minister constituency. That's the next one I got when you read Arnold. So I'm making sure now that from this one, now, I step up my game. And he shared an even wider vision for his special creations. Another thing too that I really look at to um, execute are looking at the Bukedika Gardens. I know it's a very big area and I want to do 11 parishes, but I want to make them got like eight feet, eight feet in size mm. for each parish. You will put them like five feet apart mm. so that people can walk in between them. Mm and then they would take wonderful pictures, you know what I mean? With their oh, parish. With their parish. And also to so that put some lights up underneath so that on a night now, when you light up, you will see the, the map of Barabas light up. That would be beautiful. Meanwhile, Omar says one of the greatest joys of his work relates to his ultimate legacy, his son, Raniel, who is already starting to excel at the family business. Uh, having my son side of me and doing this work, I want to pass on the legacy so I don't want it to die with me because it's very, it's very, um, it's a niche, it's a very niche market, right? So it's best to get my son, um, one or two more young people that are really interested to come and join because look, this is a dying trade. My son, he, he could catch on very fast, the sauce trade, carve a lot of things by himself. So I really appreciate how my son, Renew Ward, is really handling himself. In the meantime, Omar recently started to expand his range of products by creating some customized headstones for grieving families. But we'll share more about that venture in an upcoming episode. But for now, if you'd like to get in contact with Omar Ward and the team from Carl by Hand, just give them a call or WhatsApp 241-2765 or check them out on Facebook and Instagram with the handle omarward.carvings or email omarward.carvings at gmail.com. 
But that's all the time we have for this week's edition. I'm Ryan Broom, and this has been Minding Your Business. Minding Your Business. Well, that's our time today. Thank you for yours. I'm Pearson Bowen. For the crew, to all of you, good night. By God's will, we will see you tomorrow.